Hello everyone, officially on episode 5 of the Baron's Chat Podcast, I am your host as usual, Ziggy Salvation. I think today's a good day to talk about these big, huge, not necessarily intelligent ogres. As you go through your adventures of Azeroth, everyone at one time or another, and multiple times really, have come across them. Whether it's Dire Maul, or over in Terran Mill, there's all, they're always around, yeah. But how much do we really know about them? Aside that we noticed one of two variations, either they have one head and a gigantic hammer, or a maul made out of rock. Or they have two heads and they have a toga and a staff, right? Ogres are these large, brutish humanoids that are actually, believe it or not, native to Draenor. Back in Draenor, they are not necessarily called ogres as they're called Dogar. Right, meaning the known earth. They're believed to be descendants of the stone giants that were known as breakers. They were originally enslaved by their progenitors, the Ogron, which would be guys to think of as far as who the Ogron are, like um, the twin Ogron from Warlords of Draenor, right? Eventually, the ogre hero Gog, who was a Gron Slayer, showed that it was possible to kill the Gron, which both ogres and Ogron revered as godlike beings. That is when he founded the Gorian Empire, that would come to rule much of Draenor for centuries until the Draenei came along. Over the years, their influence kind of kind of faded around the world because they're slowly being passed by another descendant the orcs and the draenei would be the dominant race of draenor so to to think of ogres as basically the neanderthal to the orc is completely on track over the years you know as far as when the when the Draenei started coming to power as the leading race because of their intelligence and their their tools and the science behind them, the ogres eventually accompanied the old horde through the dark portal into Azeroth, and they even participated in the first and second wars. So at one time there was peace between the old horde, mostly orcs, and the ogres, but after the second war. The ogre clans kind of spread out, they kind of scattered, all across Azeroth. Shortly after that third war, the Stone Maul clan joined the new horde. After Rexar, you know, because he's half ogre, half orc, killed their chieftain. And then going forward into the Cataclysm, the Dreadmaul tribe was partially re-enslaved by horde forces. And then at the same time, you had the Dune Mauls. They were brought into the Horde by Meg's Dread Shredder. But that being said, Ogre society is based on a clan structure in which physical strength is greatly revered and respected, but besting a rival is usually the only way to advance. We kind of talked about this before when we were, when we were discussing the Knolls and how their whole societal working kind of happened. Ogres to Although intelligent, aren't necessarily so intelligent that they don't rely on brute strength. During this, you know, the Ogre Magi came into existence due to magical intervention because of one orc warlock that we know and hate all at the same time, that being Gul'dan. Those Ogre Magis are usually 
ones to really strive for an elevated position among the clans. But to the alt on the you know to the alternate Draenor, you know, the Gorian Empire, they were ruled by Imperator Margok. But they aligned with the Iron Horde. If we want to go back a little bit further, ogres can trace back to Grand, right? Who was the stone giant created by Agamar, the Titan, to defeat the Evergrowth and the those big plant like spore mounds. But as as Grand and the spore mounds fought, pieces of the battling Leviathans fell to earth. And then they gave rise to Colossals, who are essentially children of Grand. And the Genosaur, children of the Spore Mounds. But after Grand's death, the Colossals continued fighting Spore Mound through Batan and its minions. But as time went on, a lot of the stone giants kind of, they, they essentially fell to, to their enemies. From the Colossal's remains, new creatures known as the Magnaron emerged. And after the Colossal sacrificed themselves to destroy Batan in a massive, massive explosion, spores from the plant creature's bodies, teeming with the spirit of life, kind of drifted back into Draenor's surface and kind of clung to the highs of the Magnaron, which weakened them, right? But a lot of the Magnaron that devolved into beings called Gron, and even from our small adventure eyes, are massive. And this is what you get after such a huge event had occurred. A small number of Gron contributed, you know, they cont continued, they contributed to degenerating yet again to the Ogron. But that took, you know, as all evolution does, thousands of years. The residual spores transformed a number of Ogron into ogres. Ogres were smaller than the progenerators, right? And a lot of them would become enslaved by the Orgron because the Orgron saw them as lesser beings, which technically they are. The Orgers arose, you know, kind of yet to another race, the Orcs. The Ogre Lords are the only Ogres known to retain some physical traits of the Grand Progenitors. Those are the bony, calcified protrusions on their head and on their back, yeah? Which, if you think about when you go to Hellfire, a lot of the Hellfire orcs have those bony protrusions. So are the fell orcs closer to their ancestors or farther away? You know what I mean? Ogres themselves later calm down. You know, they, they, they claim that they're born at the beginning. All that when the Great Forger squeezed the light from the ball that would become Draenor, they also shaped ogres from the same smoldering clay giving them kind of a dominion over stone and earth. So if you were to ask ogres, those who deem some intelligence, they would consider themselves rightful rulers of Draenor, which is why you see a lot of them portraying a high station or, you know, where they think would be a higher society placement in the clan. The first great technological innovation that the ogre society was ever to really conceptualize was attaching a rock at the end of a very long stick to smash their enemies. But instead of trying to, you know, bash them with a rock in your hand or throw a boulder, they're like, hey, look, if we tie this to this, cool, we have range. <laughs> That's how the now forgotten tribe broke into the War Mall and the Boulder Fist clans. A lot of people don't understand that when they see these words in game, that they actually pertain to actual history of these races. But at the same time, during the Arakoas, you know, the little bird guys, the Apexus Empire fell, right? The children of stone had grown into a number and they spread across the land, most notably in, you know, the video right here, going through Gruul's Lair in, in Blade's Edge. The best fate 
a conquered ogre clan could have hoped for was to be sent into battle as disposable little gladiators and combatants against other Ogron tribes. But their sick, weak, and elderly clan members were typically offered as living sacrifices to appease the mighty Kron and keep them from attacking other Ogron territories. But in the same vein as the, as the ogres, you have the Kron Slayers. There was a group of the birds, you know, of the Arakoa, led by one named Yanzi. He wanted to claim a Pexus settlement up in Talador. Which was, it was now at the time occupied by the Ogron. Attempts to bribe or barter with them kind of ended in bloodshed and just absolute massacre, leading the Arakoa to instead begin teaching the Ogron Ogre slaves the arts of magic. In the hopes that once they taught them, they would kind of rebel against their masters. And one of the first to master his new power was named Gog. As he kind of came forward in the whole thing, he was empowered, but he wasn't there to fight Ogron. He kind of targeted the Gron, whom all the ogres were kind of respected, yet almost revered and feared as deities. They were stunned, but the Arakoa could not argue with the results. Gog did not only kill one Gron with his magic, but several. By the fifth one, the stories of his, you know, of his heroic deeds were known to all captive ogres in Draenor. So there was this buzz that Gog was rectifying and freeing the ogres as he was killing, taking the ogre and the them down, killing the Gron down because they were enslaved which kind of gave them all hope. But God quickly put a stop to it. He declared himself Gorgog, or in their language, it would be King Gog, and renamed the city Goria, which is in their, their native tongue, the throne of the king. He commanded the Arakoa to leave on pain of death. But the Arakoa soon returned to launch this kind of decided attack in the middle of the night but Gog and his apprentice Arcanists they were ready they fought back defeating and killing Yanzi in a slow gruesome manner despite the promise of undiscovered Apexus crystals other Arakoa incursions into Gorion were few and far between afterwards they kind of, if you notice, you kind of come across the Araco and not so much in those areas anymore. It's more of the forestry, wooded tree places where they can have their little bases and cities outside of Ogre Reach. Over generations, this Gorian Empire slowly expanded across the entire world of Draenor. Which is, if you think about it, for a, a not so smart race is leaps and bounds of what was expected. They're, they had outputs, outputs such as High Maul or Blade Spire Hold. They kind of popped up throughout the entirety of Draenor and all of its continents. They had an advanced trade network crossing land and sea just to bring Goria its, its whole full fruition and realization of being legitimate to the distant castles and strongholds across the entire the entire world Goria itself kind of remained the capital and it was kind of a distinguished place for these magi apprentices to be able to go and train in the arcane arts and God kind of kept that education going but being that ogres practice sorcery they're being also exposed to raw, untapped, unfiltered arcane power that had some unexpected side effects. This being the most well-known that we see on a daily basis is a very rare version of the children being born with two heads. And it soon was realized that two-headed ogres were exceptional spellcasters. 
Their appearance would be seen as almost a good omen, so instead of seeing it as a defect, they saw it as something to praise. Gloria's arcane has even developed spells to replicate said phenomenon, causing normal ogres to grow a second head and increasing a magical aptitude or intelligence. During the early decades of the Age of Order, a sly ogre chieftain decreed to dispute with the clan settled via proxy one-on-one -on -one combat between the gladiator slaves that the mortality rate amongst the ogres plummeted, leading to what they consider their golden age for expansion. But like all most capital cities, at some time or another, they fall. And Goria met its destruction. And that happened when the orcs, the notable tiny pale in size comparison race, kind of rose to a prominence across Jador. Because they lived on the outskirts of the Gorian Empire. The ogres had little interest because they weren't really afraid of the orcs. They saw them as they saw their little practices of shamanism, you know. They saw it as like more or less trickery. They they really put a whole lot of caution into the into regard. But when they witnessed the power of a shaman firsthand, they decided to take this power by force. And that's when Imperator Moloch sent an army to drive away the orcs away from the Throne of Elements and they began experimenting on their power there. There was one specific day where the dissonance between the ogre's magic and the residual energies ling you know, lingering amongst the remains of Grand, from where the head throne had been formed, caused an explosion that blew apart the entire orcish temple at the site. The incidents threw all the elements out of balance across the entire world of Draenor, causing great storms. But Moloch simply spent more, sent more spellcasters to replace the ones that were killed in the explosion. Almost like, okay, take one. We, we got two lined up. The next year, following that huge explosion, the Kosh Harg Festival, which is an orcish tradition. The sh there was a shell uh, Shadow Moon elder named Nelgarm. Was he was pleading for action? Less of all the clans had suffered disastrous famines as a result of the elements imbalance. Because instead of having normal cycles of winter and fall and rain and everything else, because of said explosion, at the figurehead place the elements would get together, everything was out of everything was out of whack. So the clans, you know, the orc clans agreed to join together, and Nelgarm called upon the elements to bless them with their protection. This united orcish army took back the throne of elements with very little bloodshed. It was quick work. But then Imperator Moloch was quick to retaliate, and the Gorian armies moved in waves. A total war engulfed the entirety of the planet. And now every orcish male, female, and child had to be prepared to fight. The Ogres imagined that as more or less a merciless you know, tactic that would strike terror into the hearts of the Orcs. But we all know the Orcs better than that. We knew the clans rose to the challenge, and small raiding groups went mobile, and slowly yet effectively dismantled the entirety of the Gorian Empire's network of fortresses and outposts pushing ogre armies back into their capital of Goria. They hit them from all sides. The orcs kept their distance on the hills surrounding, having the advantage surrounding the city, content to completely starve the enemy out. Because you can't go out and harvest and hunt and provide if you're surrounded 360 by a force, though small in stature, mighty and effective 
keeping you in check. Moloch and his sorcerers revisited their apex crystals, and the apexus crystals, should I say, searching out for ways to break the siege in time. And they figured out the Aracoan legend about the curse of Seath and began experimenting with ways to create a similar affliction among the orbs, among, among the orc clans. Soon, the so-called Red Pox, right, once they succeeded, spread completely across all the orc encampments that they had set up around the hills and around Gloria. Mass amounts of orc combatants, including Nelgarm and his fellow shaman, realizing that the Pox was an unseen attack from the ogres, and the siege was now doomed to fail. The elements wouldn't destroy Goria because the orcs to call them and help me that they were calling to aid were no longer able to respond. So once the elements and spirit and the orcs, they both understood that Moloch was to resume messing with the throne of the elements if the orcs failed. So then the elemental spirits, right? The spirits of earth and water and fire and air decided to unleash their own fury on Goria in over mere hours, not even days, mere hours. You had lightning, fire, earthquakes ravaged through the entire capital city until nothing but ash and rubble remained. Before earth itself opened up like a giant mouth to swallow Moloch and the remains of the great city entirely whole. And the reason I love this, the, the story of the fall of Goria, the entire destruction of Goria, you see that the lore writers had to only have taken an entire, you know, idea from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because at the end of it, the oppression and the deception being done there was essentially brimstone and hellfire. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then to be swallowed completely by the earth elemental. Whispers about this event would reach other Gorian cities. But those whispers were enough to discourage further tampering with the elements. The orcs became the ones victorious, the ones that were noted to be the ones now communicating with the elements. But there was little argument. The orc clans returned to their lands. But the ogres didn't really have much to do after Gorian fell. Goria fell because Nelgarm and the other shaman were particularly particularly frightened by the elemental's wrath, and so that they needed to unify orc armies. They, they didn't really want to do that because they knew if they got too power hungry or demanded too much, that the elements could turn the same fury on the orcs. But then when you have all of this going on, you insert, you know, the arrival of the Draenei, who have a complete different belief system, who have a completely different... Um, lead of faith with the Naru. So when they arrived at Draenei, roughly 200 years later, the Ogres watched them carefully, and they sent High Mall scouts to observe their expansion across Terracar Forest. But when, the, when they began to construct the great city of Shatrath, which was upon the ruins of Goria, there was an explosion of anger with the High Mall clan. It was kind of seen as an unforgivable insult, almost a completely disregarded, though to the ignorance of the Draenei who knew nothing about it, as a huge move of disrespect. These weak newcomers, or so they thought weak, built this new massive city on the bones of the Gorian Empire's great capital. But Shat had a sleek construction this otherworldly defense that kind of halted the ogres right in their place. 
Because let's think about that. Draenei is matter of factly our alien. So the technologies and powers that came with them was completely unknown. But their technology had never been seen on Draenor. And even their weakest apprentices had more refinement and effective magic technique than the even most advanced ogre sorcerer. Another imperator by the name of Hokan, or Hokten, I think it was, Hoklan, seized control of the High Mall and, and declared that that would be the place to reclaim Shatrath from, from the usurpers. He told High Mountain Clan, with every ounce of belief backing him, that High Mall would be the center of a new enlightened Gorian Empire once the Draenei had been slaughtered. As ogres regrouped, these Draenei launched surprise attacks from multiple directions, killing Haklan and all of his generals, leaving the ogres in disarray. The Draenei immediately returned to Shadrath as their leader, Velen, the prophet we all know and have seen do countless acts of good in regard of the Draenei and then watch him fall. That same Velen appeared to the city's ramparts and told the ogres, just go home and we won't hurt you. Because they, you know, Draenei are a very peaceful race. They didn't want war. They, they came to Draenei to get away from war. So that being said, once the ogres saw how they're handled, they f decided to flee. And this Grand Wild War that was meant to revive the Gorian Empire had fallen after one attack. <laughs> and the High Mall Ogres never attempted a frontal assault on the Draenei ever again. They left them right where they were. So let's jump ahead a little bit, right? We jump ahead to 11 years before the opening of the Dark Portal. Look at the orcs, they have the Warsong clan, right? Still to this day, one of my favorites. They engage in a constant battle with the High Maul Orgers. They're wolf riders using a hit and run tactic to raid these ogre settlements. The Warsongs eventually shattered the entire hold that High Maul had. And they seized a lot of it for themselves. Even though the Warsongs eventually shattered the hold, that the Warsong chieftain and one of my favorite orcs in the entirety of WoW's lore, Gromash Hellscream, he be instantly became a legend amongst all the orc clans. But it was only the building in the very beginning of High Maul's woes. The ogres had a long history of enslaving orcs and forced them to fight each other in these brutal arenas to the death. And they had, you know, one particular slave that we've come in contact with many a times with Kargath. And Kargath was the one that led an uprising within High Mall, tearing off his own hand to escape the chains and challenging his fellow slaves to do the same. And those who did join Kargath, as he rampaged through the city, and they spilled the blood of their masters, man. They they kind of formed together and established, no pun intended, well actually pun intended, the Shattered Hand clan. And they went off and settled in the spires of Iraq. But over in Gorgrond, we had the Blackrock clan. And they long clashed with ogre populations over the 11 years up into the Dark Portal. Blackrocks crushed these brutal enemies and driven them from most of the region. And then you have the highly cautious and highly superstitious Bleeding Hollow, which similarly clashed with ogres in their home of the Tanan jungle. And then south you have Frostfire Ridge, where tensions were increasing between the local orc clans and the Bladespire ogres, where Emperor Keldrock was greatly troubled, but 
he knew that the waning of Ogre influence across Draenor was determined to keep his hold on Frostfire Ridge. And ever since Gorian, Goria's fall, or actually, if you think about it, the entire Gorian Empire's fall, that the population remained relatively low. So Blade Spire sorcerers conducted cruel experiments to create new creatures for labor. And the most promising results came from the Machnathal. These half-breeds created through selective breeding between ogres and orcs. Kelgrok unleashed the Machnathal as the bulk of the Bladespire army that marched across Frostfire, leading the, at the time, Frostwolf orc chieftain Garad to unite with White Claw's clan, right? To fight back, to capture several, several other Machnathal, including their elder, Leorix. But when Garad failed, you know, to lead and learned from Leorix that the Machnathal were, were not willing servants, but slaves, the Frostwolves themselves, White Claws, and Machnathal decided to unite against Bladespire. So inevitably, their plan completely backfired. So Leorix went back to Bladespire Hold and incited that the Machnathal to rise up against their own masters as the Frost as the Frostwolves did, as the White Claw did, and they kind of crashed themselves into the Hold's outer defenses, which is where the battle for Bladespire dragged on for a full, blood-soaked, brutal day before the Ogres were driven out. With the Oryx having strangled Imperator Kelgrok in the heart of the fortress, Grad offered Machnathal land in Frostfire to make a new home. But Leorix declined it and instead chose to settle his people in a remote corner of Gorgrad, knowing that orcs would never truly accept the half-breeds. Jumping forward a few years, the Orcish Horde marched across Draenor, right? We had Warchief Blackhand at the time, who offered ogres and Machnathal, a place in the Horde to increase their numbers. And then Kilrog, who was also a chieftain leading the Bleeding Hollow campaign across this primal controlled island of Farallon. But as the orcs were not just the seafarers, they had to rely on ogre ship to build vessels capable of crossing the ocean. Meanwhile, Chieftain Gromash, who was Warsong, and the ogre, who was now a bad guy, Cho'Gal, who was part of the Twilight Hammer, they toppled Hymal. And both of them relishing the opportunity to slay ogres, Cho'Gal was eager to exact vengeance upon those who had exiled him from Hymal. And he personally sought out Imperator Margrok, magically bound him from his own throne, and burned him alive. Elsewhere, Warchief Blackhand kind of tasked the Frostwolf and the Thunderlords and the White Claw with wiping out the rest of the Grand across Draenor. Ogrons, Magnarons, and the Ogres that had refused to join the Horde. It was kind of a genocidal attempt just to wipe out the evil or wipe out the bad, or wipe out the naysayers. But apart from Draenor's Gran, and apart from Hymal, most ogres had already joined, but Blackhand didn't really have interest in winning the loyalty of new remaining outholds. He had given them a chance to join, and now he wanted the brutes dead, because they didn't. Frostwolves and White Claws saw really no honor in hunting this way. Because still to this day, the Frost Wolves hold, uphold honor. Look, look at Thrall, for example, prime example. Chieftain Fenris and his Thunderlords didn't shy away from the task and kind of reveled in slaughter. They kind of tapped into their own orcish bloodlust and were completely okay with it. Because I think in that predicament, knowing how powerful the other orc leaders were, they didn't want to bring that bloodshed or enter turmoil to, onto themselves. So Fenris is like, okay, we'll do it. 
But one of the few grunts who escaped the onslaught was famously named Gruul, who kind of lorded over a small number of ogres and Gran in Gorgrond. And from his little tiny remote lair in the mountains, he fended off multiple Thunderlord assaults. But inevitably, casualties grew so great that Fenris eventually kind of abandoned all the attacks. If you look at the ogre in, during the first war, ogres ventured through the dark portal to Azeroth, but for the most part didn't really participate in the war. They were kind of favoring lands not frequented by the orcs, like the ogre named Turok, who was a lover of Black Hand's daughter Griselda, led an outlaw band of ogres who took refuge in the dead mines until they were killed on Black Hand's orders. Jumping forward to the Second War, Ogres were brought through the Dark Portal by Gul'dan after the First War to act as enforcers in an effort to quell this needless infighting between Orc clans. They also had the difficult task of keeping in check the demented warriors of the Burning Blade clan. And besides said role of being an enforcer, the ogres were also generally looked to many major battles against Ogrim Doom, Doomhammer himself. But Ogrim also had a bodyguard of loyal ogre warriors. And then you had the Alliance, who effectively countered the ogres with their mounted knights which was a strategy that served them well throughout the entire Second War. After the Horde kind of had a conquest over Kazmadan, Doomhammer planned to build a fleet of ships and launch a surprise attack in the heart of humanity's territories. Many orcs had reservations about this, for they were not really a seafaring people being so dense and heavy. Swimming probably isn't their strongest attribute. However, Gul'dan and the Stormweaver clan urged the allies that it was the best course for action. And in the bay, tucked way in the southwest wetlands, Orgrim oversaw the construction of a fleet. While orcs really didn't know a whole lot about shipbuilding, because there was no ever unnecessary for a ship, some of their ogre allies had a little bit of knowledge and helped construct the, these immense juggernauts. They were armed to the teeth in more or less a floating fortress that soon, very soon, came to be feared across the seas of Azeroth for their unrelenting ability to onslaught. Gul'dan and his followers chiseled away in one of the high elven runestones of Kel'Thalas to create structures known as the Altar of Storms. You can visit it today. Gul'dan turned the ancient arcane rituals that were once used by the Haimal Orgers to create a highly intelligent two-headed two Orgre Magis, which were much more elevated than their predecessors. Few living Ogres knew of the technique, but Cho'Gal, who was Gul'dan's follower at the time, was one of them. He handpicked the Ogres who would undergo the transformation and oversaw the rituals completely himself. So before long, we had Ogre Magi emerging from the altars, and as they were just as powerful as Gul'dan had hoped, they are more importantly, they secretly, you know, they very secretly swore their loyalty to him. Moving on to the Third War, right, following the defeat of the Horde at the end of the Second, the Ogre Clans kind of dispersed in all directions. Some escaped through the Dark Portal back to Draenor. Others had no intention of remaining near the Orcs for their bloodlust. Some Ogres made a difficult journey across the Great Sea to the distant continent of Kalimdor, where they found plenty of space to inhabit, while others remained in the Eastern Kingdoms and were ruthlessly hunted by Alliance patrols. But during the Third War, many of the Ogre Lords rallied the remnants of their scattered people for some unknown purpose. 
and they were living near Hearth Glen, right? Descendants descended into the hills looking for a fight. No one really knows what it is what they were looking for. The ogres themselves played no part in defeating the Burning Legion during the Third War. But after the war, a lot of the, the one mock that thought that is an actual member of the current horde, Rexar, traveled to the home of the Stone Maw clan to recruit their aid against Dalian Proudmoor's forces. In the Stone Maw chieftain Korrigal, he kind of refused to join the horde. Rexar was forced to kill him in order to rally Stone Maw, so he did. Out in the Plaguelands, the ogre Mugthal and his followers were enslaved by Sylvanas, which we all know how we feel about her, at least how I feel about her. But he later broke free of her control using the Crown of Will. Other ogre tribes continue to exist in Outland and the rest of the ruined remnants of Draenor, and most of them were enslaved by the Grand out in Blades Edge Mountain. A lot of them worship Gruul as a deity and answering to the High King Mulgar, and are in conflict with each of the other separate races. But Gruul's small amount of ogres that he ruled during the Horde's Rise seem to have expanded, and I don't think we're anywhere near done seeing them yet. If you go to Ogrelara, which is a group of ogres that have been granted increasing intellect by hanging around the Apexus Crystals, they've freed themselves. From their, their little demigod oppressors that are trying to bring together this new, more peaceful existence to their race. After the Cataclysm on Azeroth, Cho'Gal reemerged, and he kind of brought the legions into the Twilight's Hammer. He tried to get the Gorduni out in Ferelis, and kind of was discovered and intercepted by the Sentinels and the Stone Maul clan. If you jump over across the giant, you know, the giant waterways and the giant seas over in Loch Madan, you have Ashen Stone Smirk. And the Alliance's adventure hated the efforts of the Twilight Hammer. Morgrash Ogres, well, well, I think it was Glog, Glopgut, who was in the Twilight Highlands, were prevented from joining the Twilight Cult by the Horde Adventures when they sent the Dragon Mount Orcs. Then if you go down to Tenaris, we have, you know, the Dune Maul. They were recruited into the Horde by that Meg's Dread Shredder. But a portion of Dread Maul Ogres were enslaved by Okralon, and they were out in the Blasted Lands. Once you go through the storyline in the game, we all eventually well, previous to the Shadowlands expansion, we would all go through the Warlords of Draenor expansion, right? But that is an alternate Draenor. In the alternate Draenor, the Gorian Empire, led by Imperator Margrok, was forced to ally with the Iron Horde and supplying them with knowledge of magic in exchange for their lives. And as a result, the forces of the Alliance and the Horde raided the ogre capital of Hymal. Right, that's where that was like the first big raid of the expansion, so we get to see it firsthand. We slayed Margok and many other high ranking members of the Empire. The Dreadmall Ogres of Azeroth were recruited into the Iron March during the Iron Horde's expansion, and the Blasted Lands laid waste to the Horde fortresses of Dreadmall Hold. A lot of ogres can also be found among the ranks of the alternate Shadow Council. And the Ogres of Highmall in the Warlords of Draenor are referred to as High Ogres. It's still something I find hilarious. That they change just those little details for those who know the history and the lore to see that little difference. To give a little bit of a, a nod that this much has changed, they are seen in a higher regard. If you were to break down the appearance or the culture, Pretty simple. Aside from the goofy guys you see dancing down here, ogres are very large. They're heavily built. They're humanoid. They got round ears. They got a single horn on their forehead. Their skin tones are pretty 
easy going from between the peach to the red to deep blues and blacks. Male orgers typically range from 6 foot to 12 foot, with an average of 8, while the females stand between 6 and 10. The smallest ogre children, mind you children, are about 5 foot tall. So while most ogres are born with two eyes and a handful of every generation regress and are born with a single eye, all but a few clans recognize them as ogres. And a, a lot of them are, you know, and the other clans are also seen to be destined for greatness due to their similarity of the ogre lords. Yeah, not overlord, ogre lords. Like Gruul, for example, is a cyclop. Ogres have had many of the same hairstyles as the orcs, and they, I believe they can even grow hair on their chins and upper lip and even full beards. You just don't see it. That being said, I'm looking forward to the day where we do see it in game. Can you imagine seeing a 12 foot tall ogre with full mane and beard coming at you? It'd be awesome. The most important though, of all the physical attributes of orc or the ogre, yeah, orc too, is size. And there's a sculpture in, in Draenor that summarizes the idea that depicts an ogre holding a cleft hoof above their head. I personally think of Dern the Hungerer when I think of that scale, but it displays strength while that same subject's waistline symbolizes the great size and wealth of it. But they don't really show off their physique. Ogres kind of eschew garments that cover too much skin in order to look more fearsome to their enemies. But they more so adorn their bodies with war paints. And they do so with mortars and pestles. Good old fashioned ink and dye style. From a society standpoint, ogres have a society based on the same clan structures they always have, each clan acting independently from others. Chieftains still rule small little waves and bands and encampments of ogres with an iron fist, but they're never short on challengers, and they greatly respect strength in combat. To, in order to best a rival, is usually the only way to advance in the clan, and usually disagreements, again, like the gnolls, disagreements end in brutal violence there's there's at least one clan that is divided into different classes right that's the gorduni they have an upper class of ogres still to this day they're known as the gordok members of the gorduni who wish to become king simply proclaim themselves as such and then destroy all who might disagree after which they take on the same name king gordok we see this most famously in the ogre wing of, um, oh God, what is the, in the instance, in Dire Maul, when at the very end, the smallest orc, because us as adventurers lay waste to the rest of them, rushes to the fire in the throne. He's like, hey, I'm King Gordok now. Let's be friends. <laughs> Ogres favor crude stone, you know, huts and caverns known as, you know, instead of being a hive, it's an ogre mound for their dwellings. They often build around steam vents. They imply that they seem to prefer dark and hot areas. And you see that during the Second War, when ogres would congregate around mounds to enhance their endurance. They'd bring up their strength, their speed, and they would engage constantly in contests of hurling and crushing giant rocks to increase their already formidable strength and resilience. So they're really the first and oldest race that kind of would practice a physical routine to improve their speed and strength on a routine basis instead of just doing it while they were living. As part of it, wasn't more, it was more than a way of life. It was something to practice and improve. Most of the dismembered remains of enemies and prey. These are also the first encounters you see with meat hooks. 
you always you don't really realize it while you're going through orc mounds especially in blade's edge but there's always in the big rock huts you see the meat hooks hanging or they're you know strewn across the ground and they kind of they're not ashamed to leave them out because they kind of want everyone to see go ahead and mess with us and we'll kill you hunt you and cut you and then we'll eat you <laughs> Aside from their own tribes, ogres are often found employed as mercenaries. And if you think about by who, it's most often by our little, snarky, greedy goblins. But unlike their orc relatives, ogres are very skilled seafarers. The people of Goria thought themselves able to outlast any siege because of their ocean port. But the city's ships were burned down when the city was destroyed by the elements. During the rise of the Horde, the orcs had to rely on orger shipwrights to build their vessels, capable of crossing the ocean and Farallon. While during the Second War, the ogres helped construct those immense, massive, and destructive juggernauts. We mentioned the two-headed ogres, right? The ones that were made. To never assume that orcs are stupid is when they'll get you. That being said, due to ogres' distant descent from this primordial stone giant Grand, who was empowered by Agrimar, they are naturally attuned to arcane. So because of their practices, they kind of naturally pick up arcane magic. Which you really see most in the beginning, the Geomancers in Frostfire Ridge. They kind of pride themselves on harnessing the elements, but sometimes they overreach. Kind of like with Forge Master Gogda. We see him as a slag elemental Megmalatus in, in the very dungeon, the, the Blood Maul slag mines. Still one of my favorites. <clears throat> Just because you get to see a, a, an entire subterranean city of how they kind of existed in the flesh. Some two head of the ogres seem to have like com compound names, which should be combined of their two heads, like Chogal, Cho, and Gal. This is for each head, usually cut, you know, separated by an apostrophe. So, which, you know, if you look into the case of an ogre mage, there's one named Beeblefod, B-E-E-B-L-E, -E -E, apostrophe, P-H-O-D. No, I mean, that's essentially stating that one head is Beeble, one head is Fod. You have, you see that throughout, really, the entirety of all two-headed ogres. So, they're, they are separate entities, just sharing the same, the same body. Combat-wise, ogres are pretty straightforward. They kind of suffer as much punishment as they dish out. They rely solely on their strength and stamina to carry them to victory. We have proof that at least one ogre had all of his teeth knocked out and lived to fight another day. They're vicious opponents. I mean, they have strength to rip off any warrior's limbs. If they chose to, right? But the ogres themselves, amongst all of them, they favor the huge, spiked, gruesome rock face clubs to bring down their larger prey that they hunt. Most ogres kind of focus on a path of the warrior and the ranger, but a small percentage still choose ogre magi. They kind of still have this gladiator system. They have in the complete affinity for fighting and pitting others to fight and I don't think they necessarily see it as as anything but something of honor if you're the strongest most badass gladiator around you're going to be highly respected amongst your other ogres and we see these ar arenas in the game still today we see the high mall coliseum we see the stone mall arena we see the mall we see the ring of trials we see the ring of blood the circle of blood rather than using 
clasps and locks, ogres bind their slaves to using unbroken stone circlets. After centuries of manipulating earth elementals, kind of lets them simply shrink the manacles tightly around the slaves' ankles, wrists, and neck. One of the biggest things people talk about when they talk about races in WoW is why don't you ever see the female version? A lot of people take this, this sexist approach saying, oh, they must be not seen because they are, you know, they're meant to be kept and bred. Not really always the choice. We see it mostly in the main races, we see male and female, because A, player choice, and B, there are just as many effective female roles in the major lore history than there are of males. Ogres have the same thing. Ogre women have yet to appear in game, but they're just as common as male ogres when Aramar Thorn visited Dire Maul. And they're mentioned in passing in the Code of Rule. The few ogre females mentioned in lore include the unnamed wife of Tharg, who died by the claws of the Black Dragonflight, which is huge to be witness in itself. And then we also have the female who served King Gordok in Dire Maul, and Karga of the Gorduni. There's a mysterious island of Ogrezonia. It's said to be inhabited by a giant female ogres who are rumored to perform horrible rituals on men who happen upon their island. And it's funny because if you notice, not many people realize this, during Hollow's End, there's actually an ogre female mask you can obtain. So they're, they're completely relevant, just haven't yet been brought into the game. Now that being said, does that mean ogres are going to play a bigger role down the, down the line? Because with Shadowlands, we just bounce back to 60. And there have been no new races mentioned as far as unlockable. Knowing that ogres are both alliance and horde known and have been known to be mercenaries on both sides and have been known to interact with both sides. I still feel that they would be a horde race. And I feel they'd be a horde race just because, A, I mean, yes, they're, the you know, orcs are descendants of them. But they've always seemed to be more aligned and work with the orcs because they're so closely related. If we take a deeper look into what makes an orc, you can also look into their food habits. It's a known thing, but also often overlooked. They have a staple diet of fresh meat, right? Ogres like their food fresh. They're known to keep their prisoners alive until they're ready to be served. When eating humans, ogres prefer to devour them alive due to being fresher. Because when cooked, however, the body is cooked with the blood still inside, night elf meat is considered as tasting horrible. <laughs> they, they make note of it. They also enjoy the finer cuisine, like roasted quail as a light snack, or polishing off an entire quail in one bite. Though smaller races, they're most easily eaten with hands. <laughs> Ravagers are favorite ogre snacks when they're small and not as deadly. And by ravagers, I mean the ones that we see on the outskirts toward going towards Zangamarsh and Hellfire. So there's no self-respecting ogre that goes into battle sober, either. Stomper Creed claims that Ogre Hooch is the best of all Hooch, and Gordok Hooch is the best of all Ogre Hooch. And examples of these behaviors you can buy ogre mead during all of the, uh, was it, during Brewfest, right? And in the game, these beverages include, but aren't limited to, ogre mead, the bruisery, hot and roth, the bruisery makes an OPA, you have ogre moonshine, you have Krieg stout, and good old fashioned Gordok green grog. Ogres are quite slow, right? Risers 
and they tend to be most vulnerable just before dawn. You see them sleeping quite often. Among the High Maw clan, it's customary to treat, you know, lone visitors with curiosity. So they're not always just intruder, kill it, eat it. It's funny because even the ogres of Dire Malls celebrate Midsummer Fire Festival. There's an ogre ritual that involves cupping a bone wasp with their hands and shaking it vigorously. And then the venom increases strength and evokes vivid imagery. It's a <laughs> bone wasps are essentially the ogre's licking toad. Deep purple wings of royal moth are also highly sought after by ogre magi, believing that they can bring prolonged life when adding to potions. When communication comes to the, to the thought, when you're thinking about ogres, you think it's just a bunch of grunts and growls and pointing and, you know, barbaric sign language. But on ogre, on Draenor, ogres spoke their own tongue. But most of them, even to this day, appear to mainly speak orcish in common. The written word is mostly used as an instrument for the upper echelons of Imperial Ogre Society, and occasionally an ordinary ogre will try his hand at making a story immortal, such as a pictogram or a carving. Comparing a female ogre's hair to a cleft hoof shaggy coat is a term of great endearment. They'll be like, wow, you know, say you see the ogre female. Looking mighty cleft hoof today. Babies. <laughs> As far as the faith aspect, ogres have believed they were the first beings created by the forgers, thus making them one of, if correct, one of Azeroth, well, Draenor's really, most ancient of races. Prior to Gog the Grand Slayer's revolution, ogres viewed the Gran as towering monstrosities, practically gods in stature and power, but believed these giants could be killed by the likes of an ogre. In today's modern day, we have the Blades Edge Mountains that worship Gruul, the Dragon Killer, as the deity. Exactly. During the negotiations of Gramshar, Imperator Margok disdainfully thought of himself how typical of little beings to look for something outside of themselves to praise, referring to the orcish like belief system in the elements. And then you have Orgola storytellers that describe Orgola as heaven of how the ogres that have reached a higher existence away from the bloodshed and violence to peaceful illumination. Ogres in the Blades Edge Mountains, for example, occasionally utter phrases that you see, such as king, queen, that there really is an ogrela, and me go to ogrela, because they have such, you know, basic communication. If you look at the Warmall ogres in the Grand, they have, you know, they think Garak the Earthsipper, who's the rogue earth elemental as their deity. And you see it because when you slay them, you pick up their beads. It's their prayer beads we're picking up. It's not just high mall beads or warm mall beads. It's a friggin' earth elemental rosary. <laughs> when you go to Frostfire, another prime example, you have the Grim Frost clan, clan right? They were that giant lava worm that we that is you know the 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 rare of the area the Barak the Devourer, and then you have like the Grim Frost Worm Priests. If you notice while you're trying to slay Barak the Devourer, you have other ogres bringing sacrifices to this massive creature, and now you know why. So as far as new, you know. Going forward into Shadowlands, you have the new horde, right? The really only known orcs or ogres, as far as clans go now, are found in Tenaris. You got the Dune Maul. Then you have the Machnathal, which are the ha you know the half and half ogre found. They're mostly out in Blades Edge, still in Draenor. And then you go down to Ferelis, which is where you find the Stone Maul, and they're also in Duskwall Marsh. They were you know, recruited to the Horde by Rexar when he killed Korgal. So we see alliances of the Horde and Ogres 
in the game already. The question is, when are they going to make it into playable? If you look at the old gods forces, you have, you know, Twilight Hammer, Blood Eye, Fire Guts, Morgrash, Spire Stones. They're mostly in like Lower Black Rock Spire or Lock Madan, some in Burning Steps. Then they have the Iron Maul clan, or the Iron Horde clans of High Maul and Blade Spire and Blood Maul. Who else is in there? We had Dread Maul. A lot of, you can obviously see where the hammer, big stone hammers very fond of because of their names you have the grim frost the gorduni and the stone mall who are also in gorgon but there's also the unmentioned and unaffiliated ogre clans that we come across that still present a threat the angarash out in zangamarsh you have ash mall and ashran you have the blade spires in blades blades edge mountain Boulder Fist are out in Arathia Highland. You see them all the time. You got the Crush Ridge, who are up in Altaric Mountains. Deadwind and Deadwind Pass. The Dust Belchers in the Badlands. You know, the Glop Guts out in Twilight Highlands. And of course, the Gorduni, who still reside in, in Dire Mall. There's also the Gorvash in Athra, Ashran. And the Mwasharg in Northern Stranglethorn. If you look at all the different types of ogre clans, they have the same kind of effect they had in Draenor as they are spread everywhere in Azeroth. Duskwood has a splinter fist, right? You got Gilneas, who have the servants of Koroth. And then, of course, there's the Ogre Legion, but they were only seen during the Third War. Ogre mages, now going past the clans, there's also the subspecies and the half-breeds, right? Now these have to be noted because they are an asserted part of the heritage. You have ogre mages that are the two-headed spellcasters, and they're a little bit smarter than your average ogre, and they've been around since Draenor, yeah? And then there's the ogre lords. They're a little bit larger, they're a little bit more intelligent, but they also are believed to be more closely related to the Grand Ancestors than the known Ogres of today. And then you have Half Ogre, which are mostly members of the Machnathal because they have Ogre and Orc blood coursing through their veins. Ogres are one of, you know, they were one of the last races of Draenor's actual titan giants. And it's nice to see that they're still around today. Going forth, I hope that they start to develop a little bit more about Nath, who was an ogre war god, right? He was... They had bone crushers that were seen as living avatars of him. And Machnathal is said to supposedly mean sons of Nath. Nath, they even have, you know, their own tribes. They have the Torch Belchers. They have the Stone Gods. They have the Tanma. So we'll see. We'll see where we go in 11 days. 11 days starts the new adventure for all of us as we plunge into the Shadowlands and see what the writers in the lore of the game take us further. I hope today that everyone learned a little bit, at least one thing, about ogres that you didn't previously know, say an hour ago. As I said last time, I am completely open to any suggestions of what you guys listening want to talk about you can always get a hold of me on any of the social medias as far as email goes something a bit more private go ahead and drop me a line at the barons chat podcast at gmail.com and hopefully i can see you next week when we tune in um i am changing I'm changing the hour and the broadcast day as we go to see what is more available for everyone. Yeah, I started this out at 8 a.m.s on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. 
and then I switched to last week was Thursday in the morning and today just due to real life situations to say let's shoot for five o'clock on a on a Thursday so give me feedback on that what you guys feel is the easiest time for you to sit back relax and hopefully learn a thing or two about the place we love so much I again am Ziggy Salvation your humble host and I hope to see you guys next week take care